Assalamu alaikum. May the peace and blessings of Allah be on you all as we welcome you to the MTA studios in London. In today's edition of Contemplation, we look at leadership and governance in Islam, especially at a time that many have expressed apprehension at the type of leadership and governance in most Muslim countries around the world. And with me to look at the issue is Sir Iftika Ayaz. Sir Iftika Ayaz has recently been knighted by the Queen of England. He's also chairman of Media Human Rights Committee. We find out more about Iftika Ayaz in due course. But Iftika Ayaz, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right, now let's look at the state of global tension around uh, the yeah. world. It's, it's been a, a major cause uh, <coughs> for worry. What, what, what has um, um, resulted in this state of affairs in the first place? Well, obviously, the international global scenario at the moment as we see it is very disturbing because uh, nations have lost the sense of security in themselves. And you find that everywhere there is a feeling of unrest and anxiety. And people do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. So in this sort of situation, even the governments, those who are in power, are feeling very insecure. And they are trying to do things which may be right or which may not be right mm. in order to hold on to power. And in that struggle for power, they have completely neglected their people. They have neglected the rights of people and you find that uh, the whole burden of suffering is put upon the common people in the country. So apparently this is a situation which has to be addressed. And obviously one of the major factors is that in what is going on in the world today, there is the absence of relationship and the consciousness that there is a creator, that mm -hmm. there is a God. And the relationship with the creator and God has become very weak. People have begun to trust in themselves more than they would trust God. Mm -hmm. And that is why things are going wrong. And actually, they have no true leadership. There is no true leadership. Mm -hmm because the very people who are now holding the reins of nations and governments are the very people who have been brought up in a society which is and which has been unfortunately a corrupt society. Yeah, I, 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 we could go on and on, uh, but then uh, with this overview, let's uh, narrow it um, to the Islamic concepts of governance and leadership. What, what is the Islamic concept of governance and leadership? You see, the Islamic concept of governance is a government which is all-inclusive, which makes no discrimination of whatsoever against anyone who is a citizen of the country, who is a national of the country. No discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, no discrimination on the basis of language, no discrimination on the basis of faith or religion. This is the very fundamental principle of good governance. Where there is a bias, where there is uh, a tendency to favor one group than the other, that goes even to the extent of political parties. The role of political parties is not to vie for power. The role of political parties is to play a positive role in creating and in making a strong government which will take care of the rights and the development and prosperity of the people. So this is the problem. In Islam, you find the very first thing which the Holy Prophet Muhammad Peace and blessings. Yeah, yes, be, be, before we go to um, how the Holy Prophet administered, um, you know, yeah. um, 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 leadership at all le yeah. levels, yeah. let's look at the problems with the 
Islamic uh, leadership, which you've just started enumerating, what could be responsible? You have given us an idea yeah. about how the administration of Islamic leadership should be done. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. that is not what That's we see. Yeah. Why is it so yeah. in Islamic countries? Now, you see, particularly in Islamic countries, the thing is that because of the poor following and performance of Muslims in practice, they've lost their dignity in the international world, they've lost their respect in the international world, and they are looked down upon all the other nations and big governments of the country. Now, there is a tendency amongst Muslim groups to regain that respect and glory which Islam enjoyed for a very, very long time. And because they cannot do that on the grounds of an attractive and a beautiful performance and practice, they're trying to do it through other means, which are absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. Islam cannot gain its glory through sword and fighting and killing and shotguns. Mm -hmm. That is not Islam. And therefore, there has been a tendency amongst the Islamic nations to divide up in violent groups. And if they cannot kill others, they kill their own people. And this is a very unfortunate mm. thing that is happening in Muslim countries today. Right. Now, many have expressed apprehension, especially at um, um, infractions of the law, lack of respect for human rights. Yeah in Muslim countries. Unfortunately, many people have bought into it, thinking that that is what Islam projects. Why, why is the situation like that, Re lack of respect? Because you have been at the United Nations on many occasions, you know, promoting human rights. W what, what is wrong uh, with uh, the Muslim leadership? Well, it's basically a, the lack of knowledge, lack of information, and negligence. Now, it's, there is no other religion which has taken <clears throat> such great care of the rights of humankind as Islam. Mm. Because right in the first place, when the Islamic society was founded, again by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in Medina, the first thing he did was to prepare the 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 constitution of Medina, Misak al Medina as it is called, the agreement of Medina, which involved all the people. And that constitution established the fundamental rights of all, including women and children and non-believers and mm. everybody. And that, that code of human rights is the best code world ever had the uh, Charter of Human Rights, which was prepared by the United Nations in 1948, is not a comprehensive and complete charter. For instance, the rights of women are very much not taken care of in mm. that charter. Mm. I, I ask, we, we, we will come um, um, to look uh, comprehensively at the rise of women in Islam within this um, yeah. context. But then, looking at how you are, you know, given a lot of uh, prominence, yeah to issues of human rights yeah. in, in the Quran. Yeah. Is, is it that these leaders don't read the Quran? Because as I said, many people have bought into the notion that Islam mm. does not promote human rights. Yeah. That is why these leaders uh, continue to um, go um, contrary to the teachings of Islam with regards to human rights. Well, that's very, very true. Uh, as you have very rightly said, how many Muslim leaders really understand and recite the Holy Quran regularly or every day and follow it. Because if they were following the Holy Quran, then there will be no problem. You see, in the Holy Quran, God Almighty says that truly he is the king of kings and everything belongs to him. And he has given a custody to an individual to take care of Allah's creation the humankind, you know, and take care of them in, in the sense that they are given all their freedoms, they are given all their rights, 
They are provided with the basic fundamental needs which Allah has prescribed in the Holy Quran. That is shelter, clothing, and food. But today you find that uh, the Muslim countries particularly are ripped with poverty. Mm. You go out of the main cities in any Islamic country in the world and you find people suffering. There is no drinking water, there is no electricity, there is no sufficient nutritional food, there is no health service and people are just suffering. And while the, these very Muslim countries boast of their wealth and fortunately Allah has provided them because of the blessings of Islam with so much treasure of wealth, mm. you see, in their land, that if they wanted to make every individual in the country a rich person, they can do that. They have the money. But unfortunately, unfortunately, they are not taking any notice and care mm. of the teachings of the Holy Quran. They do not understand the teachings of the Holy Quran and they don't follow them. If they were to follow those teachings, there will be unity in the countries. There will be no rift amongst people. There will be no grouping mm. and there will be no conflicts and fighting and killing. Mm. This is all happening just because the negligence of the teachings of the Holy Quran. Mm. Right. Now, let's look at how some of these uh, Muslim leaders um, relate to non-Muslims. We know how the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be on him, um, related peacefully to non-Muslims without applying Sharia, you know. But then we don't see it now. If you go to some Muslim countries, foreigners are treated as slaves. They are treated without a due regard to the law. Why is it so? Well, this is just, you know, I think the main cause, as, as I said earlier on, is that false and fake desire to regain the glory of Islam. <coughs> now, they cannot just regain the glory of Islam by killing those who do not believe or saying that if you do not believe in Islam, we will cut your throat. That's not the way. And this has actually happened. Mm and is happening in some countries, you know, where people are just shown uh, the shotgun and they are told, if you don't become a Muslim, we will just shoot you. Now, this is happening in Muslim countries. And look, I'm, I have to mention again, you know, the, the, the treatment of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu towards other faiths. <coughs> he made a special charter, a special contract to deal with Christians in his own time. Mm. He was the ruler. He had all the power. He could do anything he wanted to do. But he followed the teachings of God Almighty, that there is no compulsion in religion. And God said, if he wanted to, he had the power to make everyone believe in whatever God wanted them to believe. This is what God said, but he didn't want to do that. So you find that uh, in, in Muslim countries, in Muslim countries, this uh, uh, tendency, you know, of treating non-Muslims with violence in such a way is abhorrent, mm. is abhorrent. As I was saying earlier on, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu made this charter, especially for Christians, and he told Muslims, no one should ever damage their churches and he even instructed mm. Muslims to go and help the Christians to rebuild their damaged churches, you know, if there were any damaged churches. So such was the treatment. And then, you know, even when the constitution of Medina was to be prepared, he invited all the religious groups. He invited the Jews, he invited the pagans, you know, who had no religion at all. He invited the Christians and he invited other dignitaries and communities as well who were living in that area. So that was the attitude. Mm. That was the attitude. I mean, there are so many other examples right. of, of showing how the founder of Islam treated non Muslims. Mm. Right. I, I, before you go into the other examples, let's quickly 
um, look at women rights in Muslim countries. That is another worrying development yeah. because women are completely subjugated and relegated to the background. And a, non, a lot of non-Muslims think that that is Islamic. It, it's not indeed. You know, I mean, just uh, last week, um, the women in Saudi Arabia were allowed to stand for local government elections, you know, and vote for the first time. But that was also a very restricted mm. um, allowance that was given to them, permission given to them. But on the whole, you find that these groups which are following an extremist view of the teachings of Islam, they are, I would say, the enemies of women. You know, look at the teachings which Taliban wish to impose, you know, in their own lands, in their own countries. Look at the teachings with other, these radical Islamic groups are trying to impose in their own ways. They are completely trying to make women not only slaves, but make women and treat women like animals, you know. I mean, look at Nigeria, you know, where you have Boko Haram. What are they doing to the women, you know? They are just uh, burning uh, the schools for girls and they kidnapped, you know, so many women and they're doing this and doing that. Now, what on earth do they think, you know? Women are God's creation. God Almighty has addressed women in the Holy Quran equal to men in every respect. And they have the rights they have their special rights mm. according to them in Islam. Right. Um, again, on how the Holy, you wanted to give more examples on how the Holy Prophet um, administered the Muslim state as leader. What are some of the examples? How did he do it? That m makes it so appalling today that people should do it exactly the opposite. Well, obviously, he, he understood very well that the real ruler of this world, the real ruler of mankind is God himself. He is only a delegate, a vicegerent of God, a custodian, you know, on this land, on this planet to, to administer <coughs> The, the, the government and administer the people for, and administer them not for his own sake, but administer them for their own convenience and development and prosperity. So this is the basic, the basic principle that all the rulers, all the Muslim rulers should not think that they are the rulers, you know, they are the, the, the head of the states. They are not the heads of state in the sense that the true head of state is Allah himself. And the country has to be governed because it belongs to Allah. It has to be governed in accordance with the principles and teachings which Allah has provided in the Holy Quran. It is all very clearly mentioned how to treat people how to take care of their rights, you know. God has provided uh, a very clear model of the distribution of wealth, the care of the poor, the rights of the neighbor, the rights of the kindred, the rights of women. They're all very beautifully put in the Holy Quran. And actually, this is all that was practiced and demonstrated by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him in his life. Because as you know, you know, when some people asked his wife, Hazrat Aisha Anha, about his character and about his personality, she said he was an embodiment of the Holy Quran, you know. Whatever there is in the Holy Quran, that is what you found in his life. So his principle of administration and governance was not something which he had thought out himself because he completely believed that the, the authority, the kingdom, the empire which was given to him was actually a custody which was according to him by the Holy Quran to take care of. So he was a carer 
He was a carer of humanity. He was a carer of mankind. He was there to protect and make sure that every human being, including a woman, a man, a ch child, an alien, whoever it is, belonging to Islam or not belonging to Islam, they had all had their fundamental human rights. Mm. And this is what we see. This is what was happening in the earlier Islamic right. empires. Uh, if the, um, the policies of some uh, Western countries on um, Islamic states have not been the best. It has uh, affected the, most of the people in Islamic um, um, countries. And yet, instead of these Islamic countries supporting um, other Islamic countries to promote the welfare and development of its people, they have rather formed alliances with the West. What could be responsible for that? Well, mainly, you see, the, the, the whole reason, the background of such thinking is to gain power and prominence and recognition through material development. Now, this idea of material development has actually misled a lot of Islamic countries and a lot of Muslim politicians. They think if they have the wealth, they can win a seat in parliament in their own country. You see, by spending money here, by spending money there. Similarly, the Muslim countries think if they are well off financially and economically, they can have a great recognition and respect in the international forums, which is, which is basically, truly, a very, very false thinking because it is not through finance and the, through economic development that you want to gain recognition and gain respect and dignity. It is through your morals, your character, your behavior, the way you treat your people, the way your people feel about their own country. But there's not a single Islamic country where people are happy and satisfied. There is not a single Islamic country where there is harmony amongst the people. Mm. There is harmony in the societies. So they are trying to build these alliances even against their own Islamic states mm. so that they can gain more prominence and dignity and recognition in the international forums than their other Muslim brother mm. countries. Right. Now, if can, let's look at uh, the voice of the Ahmadiyya Muslim leadership. Others have um, called that voice the lone voice that has been talking against discrimination, that has been talking against all forms of violence in Muslim countries and other uh, acts that have been detrimental to the image of Islam. What kind of uh, uh, leadership um, is the Ahmadiyya uh, Muslim community providing in terms of addressing some of these inequalities? Well, you see, the, the founding stone of the Ahmadiyya leadership is that it has a leader we believe is a vicegerent of Allah on this planet, on this earth, in this world. So because he is a representative of Allah, he is, uh, he is representing the pure teachings of Islam, he is behaving and he is demonstrating the true way of life which was demonstrated to us by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because of that, his way of administering, <coughs> governing his community is the same as it should be in accordance with the Holy Quran. And his voice, it may be lone, but at the back of that lone, there is that great nuclear power of Allah's support. And you find that wherever he speaks, his message is rallied to millions of people around the world. And God has blessed us with this MTA, you know, through this MTA and through the media channels of the world. You, you, I mean, the world knows during his recent trips, you know, right, to Japan. His trips, um, how has uh, his message to world leaders? He's been speaking to various parliaments, various yes. leaders. Yes. 
on the need to um, come back, on the need to realize the true teachings of Islam. How, how has these messages been received? Well, his, his message everywhere has been accoladed and applauded, everywhere. Even in uh, um, the Capitol Hill, even here in the parliament in this country, even um, in the European Union, even in Germany, even in Australia, in New Zealand. I mean, you name the country. Wherever he spoke, his message was highly applauded and recognized and accepted and praised because this is the voice that the world needs today. And again, you find that the central message he's been giving is the connection between humanity and its creator, God. He said again and again that the true path towards peace is to rebuild and strengthen our connection with our creator, with God. If that does not happen, then there can be no true peace. Now, quickly, um, has his message been a, a sort of shock and a surprise to uh, the West especially? Because m most, of the, the, you know, most of the world leaders uh, b before that um, believed in a different brand of Islam, terrorism, violence. They need to kill to, to um, you know, send one's message across. Has it been a shock to most of these world leaders? Well, well actually, it is his voice which has clarified a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about Islam. He, has, he is the one who has cleared the minds of the opponents of Islam that Islam is not a violent religion. It is a peaceful religion. And as he mentioned in, in his recent uh, Friday sermon as well, this voice was raised in the British Parliament as well. Two members of Parliament, one very senior minister, they stood up in the Parliament and they said, if there is any group amongst Muslims which is presenting true, pristine, pure Islam, it is the Ahmadiyya group. If, if, uh, the, uh, as you claim, um, the um, other Muslims, the uh, miscreants, may refuse to listen, though they know the truth. What message do you have for non-Muslims who think that Islam doesn't represent peace, but rather violence? The message for Muslims is to please and please go back to the true message of the Holy Quran and look at the way the Holy Quran was demonstrated to us by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And we should, with a clean and clear heart, follow that in our life. Our lifestyle should be patterned upon the teachings of the Holy Quran and the ways of the Holy Prophet, the founder of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. That is the way for our success and for regaining our dignity and our glory in the world and also for providing peace, not only to our own people, but to the rest of the world as well. Yes, we'd want to thank you very much uh, for this massive education. So um, despite the turbulence, um, seeming uh, tension and the misrepresentation of Islam by miscreants across um, the world, there is a lone voice that is from the United Kingdom, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmed. So let's investigate and find out what he has to say. It's different brand of Islam. So till we come your way um, same time next week from the studios of MTA International in London. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.